Well, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Well, I'm at some cognitive dissonance tonight. I don't know if while well, Dave is going to talk and give some really good content, if I watch the game on my device, <laughs> would you consider me a hypocrite and fire me? I don't know. Yeah, yes, you probably would. So I will refrain from that. Um, Anyway, this is good. If we were on the East Coast and we were loading a ship, you would pass, except for Dale over here. He lopsided it, or over here, but you're just right in the middle. Yeah, this is good. Um, really looking forward to tonight, um, and uh, you're going to get into talking more about privacy stuff. So um, I think we all know that these devices, we have this odd relationship with them, some of us, and, and uh, Sunday we're talking about the heart stuff, and here we're talking about the pragmatic stuff. So... Uh, let, let's pray, and then I'll give, hand it over to you, and uh, we will uh, um, see what God has for us. Father, thank you for um, the season that we're in. Thank you, Lord, for what you're teaching us about how to apply our faith and how to live our faith at this time, at this place where you've give, placed us in Alberta in 2024. And Lord, we're not sure what these devices are always doing to us, but we know that there's something here that we don't we put a question mark on. And and so we pray that over today and over the next few weeks, you continue to give us wisdom and clarity on how to live out our faith at this time, at this place, to be on mission for you. And uh, I pray that you would give Dave clarity tonight as he speaks, and that you would uh, give us the right questions to ask and give us the right application that comes from this. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brent. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I understand I'm up against some pretty stiff competition tonight. <laughs> so, something about a hockey game. Well, last time we were together, I um, kind of insisted that you turn your smart devices off, your cell phones off. So this evening, relax. This is an exercise in digital self-control, ladies and gentlemen. But I have a pretty good view from up here. <laughs> so if I see anybody needing to scratch their nose <laughs> while looking at a score, we're going to be able to know that. So, so anyway, please uh, at least mute your devices. If you feel more comfortable, you can turn them off. So, well, uh, we're going to start off by doing a quick review of what we covered last session. Um, so well, I'll give you the, the 60 second or 90 second version of, of kind of what we uh, what we covered last time, so that we can get ourselves in the right frame of mind for what we're going to cover this evening. So, so we really started off with a history of what happened, um, you know, back in the 1900s, 1910, 1920, uh, through the 50s and the 60s, which is kind of the turning point in technology. And then finally, we accelerated another 63, uh, 60 years or so through to really where we are right now. And um, I, I made this little chart last time. Let me get rid of this thing. And it just kind of shows generationally um, what kind of technology your great-grandparents, your grandparents' parents in today's generation are dealing with. And you can see it's really accelerated. Uh, also, this is important that the, the global population in 1960 was around 2 billion people. Now, of course, there's over 8 billion people. So those combination of factors are bringing... Um, uh, kind of supercharging this technology that we're dealing with today. So uh, we said that a transistor was a device that was invented uh, back in the 60s, and today's smartphones over a period of 16, 60 years contains 15 billion now of these little transistors. I can remember the first transistor radio I had. I was really proud of it. It was six, six transistor radio, it was made in Japan. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I was on the forefront of technology. That was back in the mid 60s. Um, a fellow by the name of Gordon Moore uh, kind of coined this uh, Moore's Law, uh, that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit or what's now contained in your smartphone doubles every two years. And even though that was just kind of uh, an off-the-cuff remark that he has made, that formula has withstood the, stand of, uh, uh, the test of time up until today, and they're predicting that it's going to um, uh, hold up into the future. By the way, I did a, uh, a little bit more research. Uh, 15 billion transistors in here is actually a little dated. They're now talking about the next generation of cell phones are going to have about 30 billion 
transistors in them. So you see the technology is really accelerating quite quickly. So who are the players? We talked about uh, who are the major players, and this is the Magnificent Seven. Of course, a lot of them you're familiar with. The Microsoft, we know, uh, you know uh, famous for their office and their Windows operating uh, software. Alphabet, well, that's Google. Uh, Meta, that's Facebook. NVIDIA, we talked about who they were. They're a hardware manufacturer. In fact, they're the ones that are really responsible for this explosion in the processing power of computers. So that's, uh, that's how they come into play. And of course, Amazon, we know what they are. Everyone <laughs> probably has an Amazon account and receives at least five deliveries a day you know, from Amazon. Then we've got Apple and Tesla. And Tesla seemed like a bit of an odd duck in there. But really, when we looked at it, we found out that Tesla really was a technology company who simply put wheels on their technology. That's really all it was. But they are the forefront. And so we've uh, also found out that these Magnificent Seven, as they're called in the stock market, have a greater combined, combined net worth than every other country except the US and China. So we're talking about some really big players um, that, are, that are doing this technology. And we also found out that in addition to Google and Apple writing their own apps and, and uh, software for these devices, they have a multitude of other companies globally that are contributing to this explosion of, of apps that you can put on your phone. And so right now on the Google um, Play Store, there's a uh, little under 2.9 million apps. On the Apple um, uh, site, there's about 2 million apps that you can get. So they generate about 939 or $935 billion worth of revenue out of these apps. So it is big business. But the key, and we want to pay attention to the fact, is that these other developers of these software apps are really some of the ones that we need to be concerned about as well. So then we talked about where we're going, and I, I scared everybody a little bit. Uh, this is Elon Musk, of course, and he has a company called Neuralink. And they are working on a brain-to-computer, smartphone, if you will, interface called BCI. They're not the only company working on this. Uh, there's several. But they are now entering clinical trials. They have on their website that you can go and apply uh, to have this neural implant. And the idea is, is that they put this little implant into your brain, and it's wireless, and it connects up with your, yes, that's right, your smartphone. And you can think a thought and something happens on your phone. Now, it all starts off very innocently. Well, that's going to have great medical advances for people that are disabled. Um, so I don't necessarily have, you know, if, I, if I'm deaf, well, I can hear, you know, because my smartphone can actually transmit that information. If I can't talk, well, my smartphone can talk for me. All I have to do is think the thought. But you know that things that start off innocently quickly generate into a two-way um, type of link. And so pretty soon the smartphone will be implanting thoughts in your brain. So if you're into conspiracy theories, that's maybe where you want to head down a, a very deep, dark hole. So that may happen. All right. Then we switched our attention to what is privacy. And we thought about this for a little bit. And I mean, the obvious things are, well, it's my driver's license number, passport, you know, my, my bank accounts, maybe a security pass for work or, or health care information. And certainly that is part of your privacy. That's your private information. But really, they're just numbers. They're just identifiers for, for you. And are, are some of the bad actors interested in this information? Of course they are. Um, gee, if I get your bank account information and, and your login information, you know, I can, I can take your money and do all sorts of bad things. But it's not really the underlying thing about what privacy is. And so then we started talking about it. And I took it from a biblical perspective by quoting Luke 12, 7, where Jesus said, indeed, the very hairs on your head are numbered. Now, um, I got thinking about this a little bit, and so he, he didn't say, well, there's 100,000 hairs or 150,000 hairs on your head, and yes, I know I'm short, uh, a few, but not only he just, he just just placed them there, he actually placed them and numbered them in individual spots. 
And if you do the math on that kind of thing, because I'm a little weird, um, it, you get 2.8 billion times 10 to the 456,573rd power. In other words, it's almost an infinite number of unique people that God has made provision for in his kingdom. And so that means that everyone in here, just based on the hairs on your head, is a unique individual. And so you need to think of what makes me unique in a whole different light. And we did uh, kind of open up the floor and we talked about, well, you know, it's uh, who are your friends? You know, what do you like to eat? Um, you know, where do you like to have a vacation? You know, what makes you afraid? All of the various aspects that make you a unique individual then are things that technology is interested in. And so if you go down that conspiracy road, you know, you're going to get yourself again in a very dark place. So then we ended the session with a bit of a teaser, and I showed you all of the various sensors that are inside one of these little devices. And if you count them, there's just about 30 of them. Um, and they measure all sorts of different things. And the one that surprised me, I didn't really know about until I started doing some research, was this Soli sensor. And it's radar that reads body language. So you don't have to have the camera on to know that I'm sitting down, or I'm holding up my hand, or I'm holding my hand out. That sensor will be able to read that. And it knows, you know, what position you're in. Pretty soon it's going to be able to read your face as well. So, so there's a lot of scary things. So, so if you start thinking about this, and thinking about it that, gee, these things are on all the time, this is where we start to diverge into conspiracy theory versus what's in reality. So if you think that these things are active, gathering all of this information available all the time and storing it in some box up in the quote unquote cloud, you know, maybe that's not quite true. So we're gonna to try to dissect this evening, you know, what's, what's conspiracy versus what's actual reality. And more to the point, maybe how you can try to protect yourself. Which brings us to this evening. Puppy, dog, or snake? Okay, well, I gotta tell you a little story, and it comes back from my childhood. So when I was about seven years old, I'd never really seen a snake before. And uh, we were out on a family vacation uh, just south of Vancouver, and my dad and I and my sister were walking to a beach. And I hadn't seen a snake before. Um, but, so my dad was ahead of us, and uh, my sister and I were kind of following behind. And a, a garter snake, you know, went whoosh, across the road. I'd never seen my dad jump so high in my life, ever. So I took my cue from him, and so snakes have always been something that I've been not deathly afraid of, but uh, very, at least very cautious, let me put it that way. So they're going to be the villains in our, uh, in our story uh, this evening. Um, puppy dogs, I love puppy dogs. We've had dogs for a long time. Um, but I also understand uh, dogs can be brats sometimes. So, so there's, a, there's a bit of give and take on both sides. So, so really is this thing, is it a puppy dog? Is it just your friend? Or is it a snake, something that you don't want to touch? Maybe it's a bit of both. All right. Let me tell you about a man who walked into a coffee shop. This happened in 2019. I just want to get my notes up here because I want to make sure I get the information. So this was a fellow uh, called James McLeod. And he turned out to be a reporter for the Financial Post, which probably wasn't uh, uh, very good for Tim Hortons. However, he had the Tim Hortons app on his phone because he liked to order his special coffee and his bagel every morning and make sure it was at the right uh, Tim Hortons and so then he uh, didn't have to waste time standing in line to order. He could just go ahead and get this thing. But he got a message on his phone one day uh, in November of 2019 and it said, Tim Hortons got your, lo got your location in the background. This app can always access your location. Tap to change. Well, what kind of cryptic message is that? So he knew he had given the app permission to say, you know, where am I? Like to use the, one of the sensors, the GPS, to see where he was. But he didn't think anything of it. In other words, when he was installing the app, he said, yeah, 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 yeah. Good, 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 good. Let's just go, which is kind of a normal way of, uh, of working with these things. Well, he got a little nervous about the thing, so he started doing some 
um, some research. So being a reporter, of course, then he filed for an access to information through PEPIDA. And if you don't know what that is, that's the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, which is a federal government legislation that says, hey, if anybody's gathering information on you, you have a right to know what that personal information is. And so he did this, and Tim, Tim Hortons reluctantly sent him the information. So they provided him with three spreadsheets and 12 text files from November 2018 to October 2019, so just about a year. There were over 2,800 lines of code that tracked James' location 2,700 times in five months. Okay? They knew his IP address. In other words, what's the digital address of his phone? They knew his cell phone provider. He knew how much free space was on his phone, what the battery life on his phone was, and his location data. Frequently as often as every five minutes, they knew him. Over a period of months, the data had James's home location, his office, including which desk he sat at, um, his ex-girlfriend's home, what sporting events he attended, it was the Blue James game, by the way, his 28 visits to his grandparents' farmhouse, his trip to Winnipeg for a cousin's wedding, his vacation to Europe with stops in Amsterdam and Monaco. Are you scared yet? To obtain this data, Tim Hortons built tracking into the smartphone apps, partnered with a firm called Radar Labs in Brooklyn, New York. By default, the tracking was turned on all the time, not just when the app was used. Tim Hortons was using the radar service to track James every time the app thought he might have entered a Starbucks, a Second Cup, a McDonald's, a Pizza Pizza, an A&W, a KFC, or a Subway. Oh, boy. Yeah. So the response from the CEO of Tim Hortons was, we're not on the cutting edge of this technology. We are the blunt edge of a butter knife compared to the cutting edge collection and use of data. Pretty callous response from the CEO. All right. So Aaron Atwater um, happened to be a privacy expert uh, for a nonprofit. She had a look at the data, and she made this comment. If I wanted to assassinate you, this would be absolutely perfect. Wow. Wow. So, and that was five years ago. Where are we today? So, healthy distrust. This is an attitude. So, 2000 was kind of the tipping point for a lot of this critical information gathering. So, if you were born before 1970, Roughly 40% of your life record has been digitized in some way or another. So starting about 2000, for about the last 20 or 25 years, a lot of what you've been doing, um, especially interaction with the government, you know, perhaps health records, um, you know, um, uh, your banking, your insurance, those types of things, that information is all being tracked. If you were born after 2000, 100% of your life record is digitized. If you were born after 2020, 100% of your life record is online. Wow. And we contribute to that, don't we? I mean, we take pictures of, you know, cute little babies, our grandparents and our, our, uh, our sons and our daughters. And absolutely every place we go, we're taking pictures. And, you know, gee, uh, the, the smartphone generously stores these things in the cloud for us so that we can access them later. We do all sorts of things online. And so really, um, all of what is happening in our lives is available digitally in some form or another. Now, that's not to say that it's being stored and it's going to be used against you. Let's not go down that dark path. But it is possible that it is all being gathered. So, what if you want to unplug? What if you want to disconnect? Well, if you want complete privacy, here's what you need to do. Okay, you need to destroy all te technology devices made after 2000. Buy radios and TVs that use antennas, drive a vehicle made before 2000, use cash for all transactions, build a copper lined bunker in the country, buy pens and paper. That's it. It's just not practical. You just can't do it. So you just need to live with it. So really what we need to think about is how are we going to try to protect ourselves and keep the important things private as much as possible. 
So it's really an attitude. And the attitude is, is that when dealing with these devices, trust is earned. Okay. So before you start clicking next time about, yeah, have access to my microphone and my speaker and my location and this, that, and the other thing, think about what it's really, what you're really giving away. So that trust it's earned. It's never assumed or granted automatically. So that's just a mindset that you need to be thinking about. You need to be critical. So don't just keep installing apps or, or using them without some sort of good reason. So before you download the latest app that your buddy told you about, or your girlfriend told you about, think about, what am I going to use that for? All right, is, is that going to be a good thing to be doing on my phone? Yes or no? Maybe there's another way that you can get the same information or have the same interaction. So stop and be critical and think about what you're actually putting on these devices. Be intentional while you're using them, okay? This is not a distraction. It's not necessarily entertainment. It's not to, to keep you from being lonely because we know that doesn't work. So you need to be intentional when you use this thing. So, okay, I'm going to use it to contact my friend. Boom, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna call them, I'm gonna text them, I'm gonna go on WhatsApp, whatever it happens to be. But be intentional. Think before you just pick this thing up and, and start using it. And keep your house clean. So. You may have put an app on, and you used it for a little bit, no, then you lost interest, or somebody else doesn't really, uh, that you were using it with, you know, they're not around anymore, so, but the app stays on your phone. You don't think to take it off. So you need to do some housekeeping in taking off apps that are no longer needed. I think that's really important. Now there's some other technology deep dives that you can do as well, which have to do with these apps, what sensors do they have access to? We're not going to cover that in detail this evening because otherwise we're going to be here and they're going to have to serve us breakfast and that's, that's just not going to work out. But try to keep your house clean. Again, just an attitude. Think about it. Maybe you need to dig a little bit deeper into what's going on. All right. Now, we got a lot to cover this evening and I want to cover five major action categories, if you will, of things. So before you start thinking, oh man, I, I'm, I'm never gonna be able to keep up. Just relax. What I would like you to do is just take and understand the concepts, concepts and take the information in. I'm going to work on a cheat sheet for you. And so then um, I'll, I'll have to work with the church and see if we can get a way of distributing this to you online. And so we'll have some basic instructions about some of the things that I'm going to talk about. And then maybe some links to some YouTube videos that explain the technical details of how to do some of these things. So please do not get distracted with, well, I have, I have to make a note about what he did because you, you might miss a lot of information. So, so please just relax and try to understand the concepts of what we're dealing with here. All right. Action number one, and by the way, we're going to start with the easiest and the cheapest, and, the, and then we're going to progress slowly, slowly through to more complicated things. So, well, Pastor Brent's stolen my, my thunder here. Turn it off. Now, this sounds frivolous, but in essence, it's not. Because if you think this thing's on 24 hours a day, you can at least cut your exposure down by one third. And how do you do it? Help me out, how do you do it? When? When you go to bed, absolutely, why not? Why don't you just turn this thing off when you go to bed? It's dead simple. And not only does that help you personally, with peace of mind, you're not gonna be interrupted, but also it helps the phone because the technology in, inside the phone, it builds up little files, garbage, if you will, inside, and it clogs up the memory and all the other things, and it makes your phone slow down, and it makes it a little unstable. So turning the phone off is also healthy for the phone. So let's keep our phones healthy, right? And also help ourselves. Now, there's a question that I'm often asked is, when you turn one of these things off, is it really off? Well, I've done a fair bit of research on that, and the answer's unclear. Most of the um, pundits that I read say, yes, it does. But I've also read of instances where, for example, emergency alerts will even come through a cell phone that is turned off. And I'm going to bet my bottom dollar 
that the newer technology that comes, the new releases of these things, as they come out, the best you're going to be able to do is put them to sleep, not necessarily turn them off. And certainly, the days of taking batteries out of this thing, that's long gone. That's, that's okay, decades old. So, so turn it off at night, turn it on in the morning, and if you feel so inclined, turn it off during the day. Not doing it, going to go for a walk, going to do something else, just turn the thing off or put it down. Do something, just get rid of it. All right, a tip. Come on, there you go. Get yourself one of these. This is called a Faraday bag. Well, what's a Faraday bag? Well, it is a bag that is a special liner in it that prevents RF waves from penetrating the bag. And so if you take and you put your phone in this bag and seal it up, then all of the communication to this device is stopped because the RF, the radio frequencies can't get in and they can't get out. So, Faraday bag, and these things come in all sorts of varieties and shapes and sizes. You can get Faraday boxes, you can get Faraday cages, you can live in a Faraday cage if you wanted to. Um, so, but these things, and these are available on Amazon or through a whole bunch of different retailers. They, uh, I think the lowest one costs is 15 or $20, and you can spend hundreds if you want, depending on if you want pearls and diamonds on them and all that other kind of stuff. So, so anyway, uh, I've got a couple of them. Lena's going to, uh, to pass them around so that you can have a look at them. Uh, they're, they're kind of unremarkable to look at, but they're very effective. So we'll start there. So... So turning your phone off and putting it in a Faraday bag, sealing it up, putting it beside your bed, you're pretty assured that that device is off and it's not listening to you. All right. So that's action number one. Hardly cost you any money, and you're already one-third better as far as protecting your privacy. All right. Action number two, multiple identities. So right now, probably most of you have one email address, one phone, you know, maybe a computer uh, in an office or a tablet or something like that, but it's all tied to one account. I think you can do a little bit better than that and do it quite easily. And so um, we're going to talk about multiple identities as you uh, go on to the internet and use these apps and, and so on and so forth. And I've divided it into three. Now, um, so we're talking about three different um, identities for you, email addresses, if you will, because that's really where it's going to start. And we're going to divide it into high security, medium security, and low security. And where should you be doing and what should you be doing with these things? So, by the way, I've got, um, at last count, I think about nine email addresses that I use. Lena's got uh, two, maybe three, yeah, two. So we've divided things up so that um, as we do particular functions on the phone or on the computer, you know, we're, we look like different people, um, you know, to, uh, to the people that we're dealing with. So the first one we're going to call super security. So this is the one that you uh, want to treat like your bank vault, if you will. And so here we have our government ID, um, our banking, medical records, accountant, lawyer, insurance broker. So if you're doing any interaction with uh, Revenue Canada or... Um, uh, you know, the Pension Benefits Board or anything of that nature, you want to use your super security ID. It has a common email address through a trusted provider. Now, this is important. Right now, I'm going to recommend two to you. There are more, of course, Microsoft or Proton. We're going to talk about Proton a little bit later in the, in the presentation. But somebody that is a trusted provider, if possible, I would avoid... Gmail or Yahoo or some of the other providers. So try to get to somebody that you actually have to pay a little bit of money for that email address. And that comes back to what Pastor Brent said a little while ago. If you're getting something for free, you're the product. Whereas if you're paying Microsoft, you're actually paying them money on a monthly basis or an annual basis to get an email address. And so that's a business exchange and they tend not to sell your information. Uh, to other people. So, the other thing is, separate passwords for each account access. We're going to talk about passwords in a, in a moment. You only share this with trusted family members. This is closely held secret. 
It's you and your doctor know this information, and that's about all. So that's your super security one. Your me medium security one then, well, this can be the one that you use for loyalty programs, maybe transportation, maybe you're booking a, an airline flight or Expedia hotel or something like that. You're gonna use it for that. You're gonna make your purchases, so this might be an account you use for Amazon, maybe your work contacts, your day-to-day -day, day -day business happens through here. Again, a different comment email address throughout regular provider. Um, it might be a work email address. Certainly you could use Gmail or Yahoo for this type of account. This wouldn't be a real big problem. Again, separate password for each account. And you can share this with a wider circle of friends. Um, so this might be uh, your, your church group. Oh, you want to text me? You want to send me some information? Email me on this, that, and the other thing. This would be your identity that you'd use for that. And then finally, the low security. And this is the one that I've got the most of. I've got a lot of these accounts. I call them throwaway accounts. And so this is for social media, temporary access to vendors. Um, you know, you want to buy something from a vendor you hardly deal with, and they're asking, well, who are you? Well, you give them this email address because you don't care if it gets lost or used or, or whatever. Uh, news outlets, forums, um, common email address through uh, any provider. We don't really care. You know, this account, these accounts, I hardly ever check them, see if there's anything put in the accounts. I just don't care, you know, so what? It's just an identifier for me, but I never check, and I certainly never communicate, you know, back and forth with somebody using these accounts. All right, again, separate passwords for each. You can share this with anybody, and if you can get away with it and you feel comfortable doing it, use fake ID. You know, you don't have to call yourself who you are, you know, so that you can, uh, your email address can be anything, um, you know, you can be Joe Blow from Texas if you want, whatever. So you're under no obligation at this stage with this type of account to be genuine about who, your who you are, what your, what your real identity is. Because if one of these accounts get hacked, well, who cares? It's inconvenient. But you haven't lost your bank account. You know, no one has your passport number, that type of thing. All right, passwords. I always get asked, what makes a good password? Well... First thing is, it's got to be memorable. If you can't remember the password, what's the point, right? And you don't want to have it written down on a sticky note, you know, on your back of your phone or in your wallet or anything of that nature. So it's got to be memorable. Should not be obvious, non-sequential, minimum 10 characters, letters, numbers, and punctuation. And the, the most common thing I can recommend is a phrase, maybe a movie title, name of a best friend, some sort of inside joke, something that is memorable to you. So this speaks to your individual unique personality, doesn't it? You will remember something from your childhood, you remember a favorite TV show, you're gonna remember your first car, um, uh, the joke that your dad used to tell, you know, that type of thing. So use a phrase out of that, tack a number on that means something to you, and add some punctuation in there. Boom, you got yourself a decent password. When People try to hack passwords. They don't know this information about you because it's, it's very personal, it's closely held. Um, so they don't have access to that. So they look at, at what you think is a pretty obvious password and they just see it as random numbers and letters that they have to try to hack. So that type of password um, is very, very f effective. And chances are you can keep them in your head. You can probably keep a dozen of these things in your head and it's not gonna be a real problem. Well, come on now, come on, come on now. <laughs> so, so the first one up top, that's not a good password. I have no idea what that is. But I used to watch the I Love Lucy show a lot, okay? And I got my, uh, my driver's license in 1970. So I formed up a couple of uh, different passwords here. And so I just added in some, some different punctuation, you know, and sequenced it through. So very, very simple. And if you want to change your password, make an incremental change to it. And boom, you've got yourself a whole new password. So you can change the, uh, the at sign to a, um, uh, an exclamation point, or change 1970 to 1972. Something that you, you, in your mind, makes some sense about how the sequence goes, but boom, no one else is gonna be able to figure it out because, again, it is unique to you. All right. Now, we're often asked, Okay, give me the username and password, that's good. But then they want, okay, I want to send you 2FA. Anybody know what 2FA is? 
two-factor authentication, absolutely right. So, it is designed by the companies that gain access to their websites or their application to try to help prove that you are who you say you are. So, typically there's a couple of different ways of doing it. So they use it to verify a legitimate login. Usually involves a text message or code sent to your phone. All right? Hmm. Well, think about that for a second. Now what's your, uh, what's your email address tied to? Your phone number. Hmm. Not as good. Sometimes you can't get around it, but a different or a better way, if you're given the option of doing 2FA, is through a Q&A. So they have a, say, they set up a, uh, eight or ten different questions. You, you answer the question, you know, like, what's your favorite movie? And you, they ask you to type that in every time, and that verifies you who you are. So that's, uh, that's good. Um, some banks use that. Or they send you an email. Well, that's good. That's just circular. So I'm logging in with an email address, and now you're going to send me an email back to that same email address that I have to say, yes, that's me. Well, that's okay. That still hasn't exposed your phone number. So that, that just goes in a circle. That part's okay. Or sometimes you can get what's called authenticator app verification. And these are becoming more popular. You see them on your phone. Sometimes they're called Duo. Sometimes they're called Google Authenticator and what have you. And what they do then is that um, you log in, and they say, enter your authenticator uh, code. You go to the authenticator app, and you see typically a six-digit number, and you've got like 30 seconds or so to type that number into the website or the app, and, and away you go. You're good. Those are also fine because they're not tied to your phone number. They're just tied to the device. So if you've got a choice, go with the Q&A, circular email, or an authenticator app. You can't always get away with it, though, but it's something you can try. All right. So, action number two. Here's another tip. Multiple devices. All right. So, you've got multiple IDs, but you still might be just tied to one thing. Multiple devices, another way that you can separate out your individuality. And I'm going to say that a high security device, the highest that I can think of right now, is a Windows 10 or 11 desktop computer with a wired connection. Now that's pretty old school, isn't it? My goodness. All right. Why is a desktop computer better than a smartphone? Any ideas? It's hardwired. It is hardwired. But more than that, what else is different about it? What do we talk about these things are loaded with? Sensors. Exactly. Desktop computers have little or no sensors in them. So you can have that thing sitting on your desk, and it doesn't know that you move from here to here. It doesn't know that you put your hand up. You know, it doesn't know that you're talking to it. It's kind of dumb when it comes to that kind of way. So, so these really, even though a little bit old school, are kind of high security. And so if you're going to do a lot of your high security type work, your banking work, your government access, your health records and what have you, this is by far the most secure way of doing it as opposed to your phone. The next thing would be medium security. Well, you can get yourself a laptop, you have a, a Windows or a MacBook. Now, laptops tend to have a few more sensors in them. Sometimes they have GPS built into them. They certainly have microphones. They've got cameras, so on and so forth. So, so you're, you're starting to get back into that sensor arena. Uh, tablets. Um, so you can get yourself uh, uh, lots of Google-type tablets, Android tablets. Uh, um, what's the Mac one call? I forget. IPad. iPad, there you go. Yeah, you can get those things. Now, they do have sensors in them. Okay. Not as many as your smartphone are, but they do have some sensors in it. So it would be a, an acceptable alternative. And then the last one, of course, is smartphone. And notice in both of these, I put with sensors disabled. Ew, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you later on. That's in the bonus round, if we get that far. All right. And low security, use whatever you want. Just doesn't make any difference. Use your smartphone. Use your tablet. It just doesn't make any difference. All right. How are we doing? Let us talk about 
an exception to the you are the product. And I call them sanctuary applications. So there are applications that have been developed that are free of charge, that do not purposely track you or your information. And I call them a sanctuary application because it's like this church. Anyone can walk into this church, feel welcome, sit down, um, enjoy some entertainment, if that's how they view worship. Sometimes they can get a free meal. You know, they can uh, hear an inspirational speaker, and they can even get their soul saved. Um, and so that's what happens in a church. There's no cost or obligation. It's mostly run by volunteers. Yes, there's some paid staff to help guide, you know, the organization and what have you. But it's volunteer-driven with good intentions. And so these are sanctuary applications. And I did uh, pull a quote from Second Timothy. Um, For men will be, um, and then, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, uh, without self-control. That sounds like the regular internet, doesn't it? <laughs> so, and from such people turn away. And so then, there's these uh, sanctuary applications. And they're, uh, they're global in nature. And they make excellent products, uh, for the most part. And they're free of charge. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about some of these applications and how you can, um, how you can use them. Notice I've now got a little rabbit icon up here. So every once in a while you're going to see this and we're going to go down a bunny trail <laughs> and just talk about something a little bit different. So, excuse me. So, what's a good sanctuary application? Well, the first and obvious one, probably the most popular, is Wikipedia. Yeah. And this is a great source of researched and documented information on just about anything. It's the old school encyclopedia online. They don't charge you for it, and the information is stellar. Most of the time that I've read um, articles on here, they're without political bias, without religious bias. It typically is fact-based and gives you a good rundown, and you would be amazed at the things that you can find on there. Type something into the search engine on, the, on Wikipedia, and chances are you're going to get something very, very relevant. So if any application you're going to install on your smartphone and your device, put Wikipedia on and use it as your first go-to place to get some information, some background information on, on what you're interested on. All right. So here are some of the other ones that we're going to talk about uh, this evening. And they're all going to have a specific um, a place on your phone and in your uh, work with, uh, with phones. So Brave, this one over here, and this funny icon over here is called Firefox. These two are browsers, and they are browsers designed with privacy in mind. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Start page is a search engine, just like Google, but it's private. Okay. KeyPass is a password manager application. And finally, Signal is an encrypted communication device, much like texting is. And so these are applications that we're going to talk about in depth. And they work on Windows devices, they work on Android devices, and any Apple devices. By the way, just so we're clear, I talk about Android devices. On smartphones, anything that's not an Apple phone is an Android device. On tablets, anything that's not an iPad is an Android device. So Samsung, you know, use is an Android device. Lenovo is an Android device. Motorola is an and Android device. All of these other off-brands, these are Android devices. And that operating system is made by Google, by the way. All right. So let's talk about the browsing. And so action number three. Secure browsing. So these are the three browsers that are the most popular right now. Safari, that's an Apple one. Chrome, of course, is, uh, is Google's. And Edge, that's Microsoft. Well, these things track user search activity all the time. By default, this is what they do. They allow websites to store data about your activity, about their website. They store user credentials. And they use this information to target user ads 
and make recommendations to you. And by the way, they sell this information. This is where Pastor Brent's uh, analogy comes in. If you're getting it for free, you're the product. And your product is the information that they're passing on to others. So you don't want to use these browsers if you can possibly avoid it. Now, little bunny trail. Has anybody ever read one of these privacy agreements that come with these things? Of course not. Who would do that? <laughs> it's insane. So they're purposely difficult to read and they're convoluted. They changed often and each time uh, the app is updated, chances are the privacy app is, uh, is updated as well. They're designed to protect the company. They're not designed to protect you. Got nothing to do with that. But you've got no choice. Either you accept the terms or you can't use the product. So, um, so I wouldn't spend a lot of time reading these things, but just know you're agreeing to a lot of things that you probably would not agree to normally. When you say, yes, I, I, that's okay. Another bunny trail. What's a cookie? <laughs> well, we know every uh, first Sunday of every month, we know what a cookie is because we get them in the sanctuary. But all it is is a little, small, unencrypted file that the website puts on your computer so that when you go back to that website, it knows about what you did last time and your settings and so on and so forth. So it is a tracking device that stores information about you on your computer. So if you go to like 100 different websites in a week, there's probably three or 400 cookies, little information files that are sitting on your computer in the background. And the next time you go to that website, boom, that information's there. That information's there. And we've all seen this in action. It's just, oh, I go there, hey, it magically kind of remembers me and my settings and where I was last time. And it's a lot more convenient to get to um, where you might want to go on a particular website. But that's what's actually doing um, that tracking for you or that convenience. Okay. Now, as bad as browsers are, apps are way worse. Apps are really, really bad. And so a browser is kind of old technology. I mean, this was developed back in the 90s. And for website browsers, um, you had to go to a website. And the browser, the software that actually allowed you to get there and display all the information, has limited abilities. So it won't allow a lot of sensor tracking and sensor input and access through a web browser. But apps, as we just learned about with the Tim Hortons app, the sky's the limit. They have access, the programmers have access to all the sensors that are available on the phone. Whether they choose to use them or not is up to the app developer and how much information they want to gather about you. So if you've got a choice, use a web browser instead of an app. All right. So um, I'm really bad for this. I should be using the web browser to access Amazon, but I don't. It's cumbersome. I put the app on my phone and I'm exposing myself to, you know, them gathering more information than they really should have about me. Facebook is probably one of the worst examples, as is um, just about any other social media app. They gather a whole bunch of information about you. You're much better off trying to access it through a web browser rather than an app that you install on the phone. So that gets back to being discerning and being critical about what you put on your phone. Is that convenience worth exposing yourself to that additional data? So all we need to do then is get you using the right browser and then we're gonna be in good shape. And so that's where Brave and Firefox, Firefox come in. I'm not gonna show you how to install it. I'm gonna hopefully have that on the cheat sheet for you, but you're gonna to want to put these on. And the reason is, is that they can be configured to delete user credentials, delete user website activity, delete cookies, and prevent tracking and ad promotions automatically each time you close the browser. Whoa, wait a minute. So I can fire my browser up, I can go to Amazon, I can do all the things I want to do on Amazon, order this, that, and the other thing, so on and so forth, and what have you. And Amazon put all this junk on my browser in these cookies, but as soon as I close the browser, close, close it, boom, the 
browser automatically wipes them out. And then when you start it up again and you go to the Amazon site, Amazon says, I don't know who you are, because there's no tracking information left. And so you can configure both of these browsers to do this work for you automatically in the background. Now, there's a lot of other privacy and security settings within the browsers, but the main ones that you want to focus on is being able to delete that information when you close the browser. So, but here's the way you do it. Okay, open up my browser, and I go to Amazon. Get all my information. When I'm done, log out of Amazon, close the browser. If I want to go to Facebook, open up the browser, log into Facebook, do all the things I want to do in Facebook, log out of Facebook, close the browser. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. A little inconvenient, but that's the only way you're going to be sure that that tracking information in the browser is deleted before you start a new session. Okay? Secure searching. Now, Start Page is just a fantastic little application, and you can set Start Page to be your default search engine on any browser. It's easy to do, and again, I'll try to get those instructions for you. What the neat thing about Start Page is, is it actually derives its results from Google, but strips all the garbage out and strips all the tracking out. So it acts as a proxy. So you put your search information into Start Page, Start Page goes to Google, it gets the, the, uh, all the listings that you want, but then in giving it back to you, it strips out all the junk. So there's no junk and there's no tracking. It doesn't, Google doesn't know, oh, you know, it was Dave going in to search for this particular term because it's anonymous because it's coming through Start Page. So this is, one, this is one of these sanctuary apps and it can then replace Google, which is also used on Apple devices and Bing, which is used on uh, Microsoft devices. And so definitely you want to use Start Page. It's a very good application. So the combination is then Brave and Firefox and Start Page then provide you the most secure method of browsing the internet through a web browser. Works on any device, um, provides the best privacy, and free to use without commitment or support. You can make donations to these people if you want, but they're never going to hold your ransom. Or they're never going to say, hey, you can get the pro version if you just pay us a little bit more money. Mm -mm. No, nope. free of charge. Really good deal. All right. So, sometimes you get asked on a browser, hey, you know, oh, sorry. Let's go back. Do you want to store your credentials here? Do you want me to save Google? Do you want me to save your password? Just put it in here and just, just click save. No, never is the right answer. You never want to um, save passwords or any credentials in a browser or in an app if you can possibly avoid it. Okay. We're going to talk about saving passwords in a different location um, and being able to secure them that way, never inside the application and never inside your browser. All right, so the tip is then add KeePass. So KeePass is a little application. Again, it's one of these nice little sanctuary apps, and it stores all of your password information on the device, not in the cloud. So it sits on here, or it sits on your computer at home, or it sits on your tablet. And it's a little application then, and you can store hundreds, thousands of passwords in this thing, and you can even link it up to the Firefox browser and in Windows and have it automatically populate your username and passwords um, from KeePass through to the browser. So there's a little link that you can make between the two. But that way your passwords are sitting here and not out there. Okay? So then the question is, well, what do you do, you know, if, you know, if I want to move passwords, gee, I got all my passwords sitting on here, but I want them on my tablet or I want them on my home computer or I want to just keep them safe. It's easy. USB stick. Just there. And I've got one here that I got on Amazon. It's got two types of USB connectors 
Um, big one for a computer, small one for, for the smartphone. You get a little cable, you connect it in, and in a matter of seconds, I can transfer that key pass file to this device, and I can put it in my pocket. Okay. And physical security in this case is going to be a lot better than security in the cloud. And so when you get the KeyPass application, if you want to use it and you want to put it on your devices, use some sort of localized physical backup storage that you do. And typically, Lena and I back these up about once a month. Um, and we even have a third USB key and we keep one in the safety deposit box. We're supposed to update that date every year. Uh, it's been three years since we've updated it last, so um, we need to get going on that. But you definitely want to be able to store your passwords secure and encrypted locally. By the way, you set a master password on the KeyPass application, and that gains you access then to all of your other passwords that you've got on there. And you can store hundreds and thousands of them. You can even store a picture of your driver's license, or your passport, or your signature, or your health records in KeyPass as well. So it really can be a, um, a very secure way of storing things. Well, we are starting to run short on time. Um, so I guess I'm going to ask your permission if you want me to keep going, or did you want me to kind of close off for this evening, take a few questions, and then we'll pick it up, uh, pick it up next session. It's up to you. Hockey. Sorry? Hockey. Hockey. What about it? <laughs> <laughs> so. Next session. Keep going. Keep going? All right. So. <laughs> all right. So. All right, we're, we won't go through everything that I got this evening, but we'll, let's get a, a, a few more steps. All right, so no-nos. Here's one. When you're asked to sign in to a website or an app, oh, why don't you sign in with your Facebook account or your Google account or your Apple account or your Microsoft account? No, 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 no. Never do that. That's just inviting cross-linking um, information between Google and this app that you're, that you're going to, or your website and what have you, you never cross-link um, those. So always provide a unique username and password credentials for every time, every account that you're in. Okay, one more, secure communications. And this one actually has um, significant impact to people that you may be communicating um, overseas, especially missionaries, um, where they want to keep a lot of information uh, confidential. So typically, communications then are like SMS, texting, Messenger, and Facebook, WhatsApp, iMessage, Snapchat. These are the most popular ones. Some people use X, Instagram, TikTok to emulate messaging functions and what have you. These all lack proper security. There's nothing secure about these things. So what you want to use is something called Signal. And again, sanctuary application, and it emulates texting, it emulates voice phone, and it's completely encrypted. There is absolutely nothing that people can hack into to be able to get to it. And so my recommendation, and I wish all um, people that are overseas or in, in the mission field would use something like this, and then they can be uh, confident in uh, communicating back and forth using this application. So use this with trusted friends and family. And it's fully featured. It's got all the things that you need to be able to do texting and group chat. And um, you can even make phone calls on this thing without using your cell phone, so on and so forth. So, so I definitely recommend, uh, recommend signals. So. All right. We haven't got to the fifth one. I think we're probably going to hold that over because I see some people are getting antsy about the hockey game and what's going on with it. So. Um, so let's throw it open for a few minutes of questions. And so if anybody's got some questions about what we've covered so far. Yes, Robin. Hi. Uh, with regard to passwords and two-factor authentication, yes. do you think using biometrics is a good plan? <sighs> like a fingerprint. Yeah. Um, I use it a lot personally. Sometimes I feel uncomfortable doing it, but it's just so darn convenient to push it onto my phone and away I go. Um, is it being tracked? Yeah, probably is. I guess if you're being very fastidious, no, I wouldn't use it. Or face recognition for that matter. 
question. Oh, sorry. Question in the back. Yeah, absolutely is. Um, and, well, think of it like a church. Who pays for the church? The, some, the people, the members of the church. So these sanctuary applications typically are sponsored by uh, philanthropic organizations, um, scientific research centers, universities, that type of thing. So they are well-funded and they're well-staffed. Thanks. Any other questions? Over here. <laughs> Who said they weren't? Yeah, but they are independently financed and they are not doing any harm. And I'll be honest with you, not a lot of people know about them. Yeah. Maybe. Sorry, yes. Oh, hang on, use the mic so we can capture it. I was thinking, would you say are those like the only five main sanctuary apps? Mm -hmm. Those are like the five... They're basically like the Magnificent Five. Yeah, sure. That's, that's a good way of putting it. There are hundreds of these, possibly thousands, sanctuary apps. I've just focused on five that have common use, you know, that, uh, that might apply to, to everyday life. Other questions? All right. So we'll pick it up next session. So we'll cover off what we haven't covered today. Plus, then we're going to talk about uh, cybersecurity. And our theme is going to be fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And so we're going to talk about how to deal with cybersecurity. And you're going to be surprised to find out it has a lot less to do with technology and a lot more to do with social engineering. And technology is just the enabler and the facilitator for cybercrime. So, well, thanks very much for being with me this evening.